Well, we're going to finish up the book of Jude today, Lord willing. I was reading in James this week how important it is to say, Lord willing. And uh, heard about a man that uh, preacher was out in the front yard one day. And uh, a man came down the road on his motorcycle. And he pulled over there and, uh, and uh, was looking for some directions from the preacher. And the preacher told him, well, you go into town, such and such a place, you'll find what you're looking for. And uh, he said, well, that's where I'm going. And the preacher said, well, you ought to say, at least say, Lord willing, that's where you're going. And the man said, oh, you mean say the Lord willing? I'm going to go in town. That's what I'm going to do. Well, the, uh, a little bit later, he looked up the road, and here came that man walking back up the road. I mean, he was all, clothes were all torn up, and he was all dirty, and, and he was limping along, and the preacher saw him, and he said, man, what happened to you? He said, well... I, I went a little further down the road and I hit some gravel and slid off the road and I uh, uh, hit a tree with my motorcycle and, and I got all banged up and then I, I saw a house up the road so I decided to walk up the, to that house and knock on the door and the man said, get off my property and, and, and I, I started to say something and boy, he started blasting me with, uh, uh, with buckshot and so I ran down the road and, and, I, and, I, and I got down the road and and then he said, that I came, I jumped a ditch, and I fell in the ditch. And he said, now, and here I am. And the, man, the preacher said, well, now what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to go to town, Lord willing. <laughs> <laughs> you better do it better say Lord willing, all right? I'm planning on Lord willing to finish up the book of Jude this morning. And uh, uh, this is a good uh, icing on the cake of what we've been dealing with in the book of Jude. We're going to begin in verse 22. And read on through verse 25 and uh, Jude 22 through 25. And by the way, let me say uh, that verse 22 is my life verse. I don't know if you are aware of that. If I sign a Bible, somebody comes up to me sometimes when I preach out. You know, you're a big shot when you're preaching away from home, and they'll come up to you. So we sign my Bible, and I sign. And I always sign Jude 22. And uh, I remember distinctly the service where God spoke to my heart and with this particular verse, and I wanted it to be the theme of my life. You ought to get a verse that helps you, that defines who you are and what you want to do in life. And, and this verse has been there for me many, many, many times. Beginning in verse 22, it says, And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pouring them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Father, I ask your leadership with the message this morning. Pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. And Lord, we pray that we'd send your Holy Spirit working in our hearts. Lord, I remember the night when that passage of Scripture, Jude 22, you drove it home to my life and my heart, Lord, and the need of our day is still with compassion, Lord, caring. We pray that you'd help us tonight. Today, as we look at this passage of Scripture, to see the heart of these Scriptures, Lord, and uh, allow them to, to change us, transform us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we've been going through the book of Jude, we, we saw that Bible Christianity, remember Jude, uh, what Bible Christianity is, Jude began to write about the common salvation, but the Holy Spirit of God took over and, and instead led him to write how you should earnestly contend for the faith earnestly contend for the faith. And throughout the book of Jude, it's been explaining what the faith is. We saw that the faith is fundamentalist Christianity. It believes something. It has some doctrine. It has some truths that it stands upon. And then he earnestly contended for it. We saw also as we went through the book of Jude that uh, true Christianity believes in a real hellfire condemnation to those who reject Christ. It's hellfire and brimstone type of Christianity. So I said, well, I don't like the hellfire and brimstone stuff. Then you don't like Christianity because Jesus spoke great amounts on the subject of hell. It's a real place. And so we saw that Bible Christianity is hellfire Christianity. 
And we see them separatist Christianity that have come out from among these creeps that have crept in uh, with false doctrines and, and to separate from them. You don't join up with them. You don't say, you don't call people brother that, that don't believe the gospel, that are some religious cult, even though they may call it Christianity, they're not your Christian brother if they don't have the right doctrines of the faith. And then we saw it's local church Christianity. That place uh, where God has ordained that Jesus said upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And, uh, and then today as we look at the final aspect of what Bible Christianity is it's something that uh, I know some people say well, that it's, a, it's a rabbit trail. It's not a rabbit trail. It's the heart of Christianity. It's not a rabbit trail. I know some people consider it a ministry of the church. It's not a ministry of the church. It is the church. It's the heart of the church as he describes in here. And we have taken the phrase that is given over in the book of Proverbs and we call this matter of fulfilling the Great Commission soul winning. It's soul winning Christianity. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that this morning. Soul winning Christianity. Now, as you know, Brother Kirk heads up our soul winning program here at the church, and they uh, that takes teams out every Sunday, knocking on doors. And I'm asking him to do something. I'm going to have him come, and I'm going to right here in my message. I want to give a little testimony of how he got involved in soul winning. If you'll do that, this will interrupt Pastor Fry's sermon for a brief testimony on soul winning. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, going back. A little over 10 years ago now, I got saved in 2023. At that time in my life, um, I was an investigator, so I was trying to find the truth. And I, I was just getting frustrated because there's so much contamination out there. What, what really happened? Uh, how did things really go down? And uh, I was thinking about that a lot, just trying to get to the basic facts and the truth. And also applying that to my spiritual life, where I was in a different church that looked good on the outside, but it was contaminated on the inside. And I prayed to God and asked God to show me the truth. And not long after that, I saw uh, a gospel presentation on the internet. Um, of course, this day and age, everything's on the internet, right? Most of it's garbage. But I actually found that great nugget of truth there on the internet, a 10 minute gospel presentation called The Bible Way to Heaven, uh, which went through the Romans Road showed me I was a sinner, showed me that I was on my way to hell, and I, need, I needed a Savior, Jesus Christ, to put my faith in to get me to heaven. And uh, when I saw that, I called on the name of the Lord and got saved. And uh, from, from that moment on, I had a huge burden to, to find a Bible-believing church. I listened to a lot of uh, independent, fundamental Baptist preaching, and a lot of those pastors were talking about soul winning and how it's a duty to get out there and make some time to share the gospel with other people. Uh, it, it took me a while to get into church, uh, many years actually, probably far too long, but uh, that burden kept poking at me. And uh, I heard uh, one pastor say that if you want to find a uh, soul winning church, there's a website called mil militarygetsaved.com. <laughs> and it's just a long list of independent fundamental Baptist churches that military members that travel around they can find a church in that area they're in on that particular Sunday or Wednesday. And uh, I, keep, I did a keyword search, soul winning, and Ambassador Baptist Church popped up in, uh, here in Frederick. And uh, probably came here a few months, uh, starting in early 2019, and I think a few months later, I was out soul winning with Brother Dave and Torque, and I uh, just went from there. Joe and Kayla were coming out, and had my Bible marked with the same verses that got me saved. Yeah. Show those to other people. It's been a blessing ever since. This matter of soul winning, so many th think that's only for the people that are super Christians. That's not for the super Christians, it's for every Christian. Uh, I remember right after I was saved, hadn't been saved very long. And Pastor took me into his office, took a little, a little, a little New Testament, and marked verses in it. And uh, here I was, just a teenager, and he marked, uh, first of all, you know, Romans ten, Romans verse, Romans two, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Romans, uh, 
I can't even think of Romans Road. So many here. Romans two, uh, Romans three twenty three, Romans three ten, and Romans five eight, Romans six twenty three, and, and Romans ten nine and ten, and, and mark those verses in my Bible. And he kind of went through and he said, well, if you want to show somebody how to get saved, just do this. And, and uh, he gave me that little New Testament and sent me out. That's all the training I had. And I remember going to uh, Main Street in my hometown looking for somebody to witness to. And I figured outside the bar, there's probably going to be a sinner. And so I went to a place called Jack's Blue Room. And it was a little bar on the front. I guess it's still there in my hometown. Uh, they had a fire there some years ago. It burned down several bar rooms on Main Street in my hometown. But I remember standing out front of there and uh, waited for a man to come out. And a man came out and it looked like he was about 30 years of age. And you remember, I'm just a teenager, and I'm probably a little suspicious standing out in front of the bar, but I was standing right at the door of the bar waiting for somebody to come out. And this man came out, and he'd obviously been working on the farm all day. He was dusty, had an old farm cap on, covered with dust, and, and uh, he was, you could tell he'd been hot and sweaty. And his hair was kind of curled up over his cap. And uh, he, he walked by, and I reached out and gave him that gospel time. and said, sir, let me give you something to read when you get time. And, and he said, what is this? I said, this will tell you how you can go to heaven. And, and he said, he looked at it, and this, this is what really set me back. Remember, now that's all the training I had was my pastor going through this, through that, just a few minutes there in his office. And uh, I knew I was saved, but that's about it. I didn't, hadn't really grown much as a Christian. But, uh, and, uh, and I remember the man took about two steps away from me, and he took that track and kind of whipped it against his pant leg like this. And shook his head. His back was to me, and he said, "I guess I'm just going to have to get saved." Now I didn't know what to do then, but uh, but you know it's an amazing thing when the Spirit of God is speaking to somebody's heart. People say, "Oh, nobody will ever get saved." You're you're talking about flesh, revealing the flesh, the plan of salvation. We're talking about the Spirit of God speaking to somebody's heart. That that man turned around and said, "I think I'm just going to have to get saved." And, and I was like, <clears throat> I thought about saying, you sure? Are you positive you want to do this? Because I, I knew what I was going to have to do now. So there was a, there was a set of steps that went up above the bar room. And I, I sat down there on those steps. We closed the door that, that, that kind of block out some of the sound of the street. And I took that New Testament my pastor had marked and explained to that man how to get saved. And he prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come in his heart to save him. Uh, and that started me down the road of so many. I mean, uh, I had been a part of my life ever since. But uh, that man got saved there that day. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, different times. Been so excited, coming back, telling my pastor. And been so excited, I couldn't even tell him where I was at. I was just, uh, some, this man prayed. But he said, who did what? And I was so excited that somebody would actually get born again. It, I was a, a new convert teenager. Can people get saved if a con new convert teenager takes a Bible and show them how to get saved? Absolutely. And I, I talked to people who've been saved for 30 and 40 years. Never want anybody to Jesus. Where have you been? Because God will use you. I came across several quotes as we get into these verses this morning. Uh, a man named Charles W. Anderson said this, When we reach for the souls of men, we touch Satan at his most sensitive spot. That's why you get in opposition. You know why somebody gets mad at you and says something uh, discouraging to you and you try to witness? The devil sent them for that purpose. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this, Go for souls and go for the worst. Billy Graham once said, My one purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes through knowing Christ. John Hamlin said, soul winning is not winning an argument, but winning a soul. Now some people think they have to know so much Bible that they can win an argument with somebody. You're not there to win arguments. In fact, when the arguments stop, that's when you leave. I don't have time for arguing. Nobody ever got saved because you won an argument. You're there to win a soul. Praying Hyde said, Father, give me these souls or I die. Deal Moody, by the way, had a equivalent of a sixth grade education. Anybody here got a higher education than the sixth grade? Raise your hand. You got you know more than D.O. Moody had. He led over one million people to faith in Jesus Christ with the equivalent of a sixth grade education. He said, I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat and said to me, Moody, save all you can. 
But he also said it is not our strength we want. It is not our work to make them believe. That is, that is the work of the Spirit. Our work is to give them the Word of God. I cannot convert men. I can only proclaim the Gospel. Albert Munson, Munson said, God be my judge, I would die to save you this day. You know, what he's reiterated is what Paul said. Paul said of his fellow Jews, he said, I would wish myself accursed from my brethren according to the flesh. He said, I'd be willing to be separated from Christ if it would get you saved. Some people wouldn't walk cross streets to see anybody saved. Uh, Paul said, I would go to hell if it would get people saved. Someone has said, you must have been with Christ and in touch with Christ to touch others for Christ. The speaker's source book I found this quote, we do not stand in the world bearing witness to Christ, but stand in Christ and bear witness to the world. George Winfield said, oh Lord, give me souls or take my soul. Give me soul or take my souls. That does not sound like the modern Christianity of our day, but that's the faith that that God told you to contend for. Fight for this thing of soul winning. Fight. Listen, as you travel across the country, maybe someday you'll look for a church. Find out what about if they have a soul winning program. If not, don't join it. Right. Don't join it. If they don't have a soul winning, say, well, they have good preaching, good services. Listen, soul winning is not a ministry of the church. It is the church. It's good. And the only real Christians we have in the church are the soul winning Christians. Ooh. Look out. I said, Chris, I didn't say you weren't saved, but you're not Christian. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. To be like Christ, I have to be a soul winner. That doesn't mean you have to win somebody to Christ every week. It doesn't mean that uh, you, that you uh, go always involved in the church soul winning program. You could not show up for the church soul winning program and still be a soul winner. Everybody. Everybody can win people to Jesus. And in this passage of Scripture, he's talking about an aspect of Christianity that must be contended for. I have to fight for it. My flesh doesn't. I don't know about you. It doesn't matter when in the week we schedule soul winning. Right before that time comes, I'm tired. You know what I'm talking about? If we have soul winning Thursday night, for some reason, Thursday evening, Thursday afternoon, I'm tired. It always happens that way. If we're going to have a Sunday afternoon, all of a sudden, I'm tired. Why? This is spiritual battle. The devil's fighting this. This, this is important. Something's going to come up, up in your schedule. Listen, we got to contend for it. We have to fight for it. We have to fight. Preachers need to fight for it from the pulpit. Uh, our leaders of our church, every Sunday school teacher ought to fight for it to make sure that uh, every one of those sitting in their Sunday school class are saved. Get in those homes. Get in those families. When I was a principal of a Christian school years ago, I pounded teachers, get in the homes of the kids. Get in the homes of the kids. Win their family members to Christ. Even in a Christian school, we had trouble getting the parents, uh, getting to get in the homes to make sure the parents were saved. Teachers didn't want to do it. But we've got to do it. Sunday school teachers, we've got to contend for this. Deacons, we've got to contend for this. We've got to, we've got to fight for the soul winning. Fight for soul winning. Fight it in your schedule. Fight it with the temptation not to do it. Fight it with your fears. And we all have fears. Everybody here, when you go soul winning, there's a certain amount of fear involved that you have to overcome. Or you really don't take it seriously if you don't. There is an enemy. There, you know, you... And uh, most of the time, it is rare that anybody's ever rude to us out so many. But every once in a while, it happens. I remember some years ago, we had a boy who lived up north of town. He had been soul winning with a couple people in the church, but he'd never been with me. And uh, he was going to soul winning with me that day. And uh, we knocked on a few, couple doors there. And we, the, people, the first few doors we knocked on, the people very kind, very gracious. I can't remember if they were saved or not, but they were very receptive, very kind, very gracious. About the uh, about between the second and third door, we're walking down the sidewalk, and this boy says, "Well, he said when you're a pastor, everybody must be very kind and respectful to you when you go so winning. Nobody's ever rude." We knocked up, knocked on this next door, and knocked on the door. The man came out. He called me every vile, vulgar name that you could think of. It's some I'd never even heard before. He's making them up. 
And uh, I mean, he begins to curse me, and, and I just kind of turn around and go, and we're going down the sidewalk. This boy looked at me and said, Boy, I guess I was wrong about that, wasn't I? Yeah, sometimes you get that, but that's rare. It, it's very rare that anybody is rude. Uh, if you have a right spirit, they'll have a right spirit normally. If you go in friendly and kind and folksy, and, you know, it makes a difference. Now, if you go with the bad attitude, and I've known some soul winners that went with the bad attitude, and it reaped a bad attitude. But you go in caring and kind. The Bible says, He that go forth, we have been very precious seed shall doubtless come again. We ought to be humble. We ought to have a right spirit. We ought to be caring. Some of the best soul winners I know are people that can't pass out tracks without weeping. We know we had our, our friend help with the, the fair for a number of years and uh, is in bad health. And uh, I'd have him come to give his testimony. And he went people to Christ. Uh, when we were out there winning souls, he and I were there one night right after 9-11. And uh, we, we had like 250 people saved that week. We had seven people under the tent at the same time. Two of us trying to lead them to Christ. And we, it was unbelievable right after 9-11. But that man, I've had him come give his testimony. He can't hardly do it. Tears dripping off his nose and down his chin. He's just so broken. We're concerned about souls. Praying for people that are lost. Listen, uh, you don't have to be uh, articulate to be a good soul winner. You don't have to have the gift of gab to be a soul winner. You just have to care. That's all. We just have to care. Now, I want to look at this passage of Scripture today. And we're going to first of all see the motivations for soul winning. Not everybody goes soul winning for the same reasons. There are different motivations. It, much of it will have to do maybe with your background. Some of it might have to do with your personality. But we find here several motivations for soul winning. If, maybe one of these won't click for you. Maybe one of these doesn't work for you. But, but find something that motivates you. Notice with me in verse 22. And some have compassion making a difference and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Number one, love and compassion. Compassion. Love and compassion. I got off the subway train in Chicago some years ago. I had a handful of gospel tracks. People were coming off the train, and I was giving gospel tracts out as people came by. And one man, I handed a gospel tract, he said, what's this? And I said, it's a gospel tract that tells you how you can uh, know for sure you're going to heaven and how you don't have to go to hell. He said, uh, oh, I know what it's about. He said, uh, I don't want it. And, and, you know, he tried to hand to me, so I, you know, I took my hands back, trying, so I wouldn't try not to accept, take it back. And, and, and I said, uh, well, you could take it with you and you read it. Maybe, maybe you'll like it if you read what it says. He said, I know what it says. He, and I said, well, and so I thought, well, I'd trip him up here. And I said, well, tell me, what does it say? And you know what? He told me exactly what it said. He said, this little piece of literature here tells me that I'm a sinner. And uh, that we've all sinned. He said, that little piece of literature tells me that because I'm a sinner, I deserve to die and go to a place called hell and be there forever and ever. He said, that little piece of paper right there tells me that, it, uh, that God loves me anyway. He sent His Son to this world to die for me on the cross. My name's preaching. And he said, that little piece of paper right there tells me if I will personally call upon Christ right now, He'll save me and forgive me of my sins and give me everlasting life. He said, now tell me, is that what it says? I said, yes, sir. That's what it says. He said, I thought that's what it said. And here it is. I said, I don't believe that. And he said, you don't either. And I thought, well, you may be able to speak for yourself what you don't believe it. To say, I don't believe it. And I said, what makes you think I don't believe it? Because he said, if you really believe that, you wouldn't be standing here arguing with me. You'd make sure everybody getting off this train gets one of these things. If you really believe that. And I thought, oh, you talk about conviction. <coughs> How often, if I really believe it, wouldn't I be doing something about it trying to keep people from going to hell? That's probably the strongest sermon I ever heard on soul winning, coming from a man who's lost. Listen, sometimes lost people see things more clear than we do. And uh, he, he brought it on home. And uh, all he had to do was stand up and sing, just as I am, and I'd be hitting altar about that time. Because he's right. We don't believe it. We, we say, well, we don't believe in purgatory, but we act like somehow after people die, they're going to get a second chance. There is no second chance. 
We act, we act like that, uh, well, God will say, well, you know, you didn't work out that plan A that I had with Jesus coming and dying for you, calling upon Him. But let's try plan B. I remember a sermon I heard from a liberal preacher years ago, Seven Ways to Heaven. He talked about, well, you know, give all you have to the poor. Oh, another way you can get to heaven uh, is that uh, uh, you, you uh, follow the Ten Commandments. Another way you can get to heaven is follow the golden rule. The only problem was there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Christ. And that's why we have to direct people to Christ. There is no other. Your mama is not going to go to heaven unless she gets born again. Your daddy's not going to go to heaven unless he gets born again. Your sister's not going to go to heaven unless she gets born again. Your brother's not going to go to heaven unless they get born again. Our, our children are not going to go to heaven unless they get born again. We, and listen, we, when we go out and talk, we're talking to somebody's child, somebody's daughter, somebody's son, somebody's daddy, somebody's sister, somebody's brother, somebody's grandma. And we're to go and care. When we go so many. Love ought to motivate us. It ought to motivate us. I don't want to stand by and just watch them go to hell. I read books last year of some of the local stories of, of this area that, that go untold many times. And one of the chapters told about a train wreck that took place up near Thurmont many years ago. And uh, in this particular train, uh, train wreck, that there, there was a, a, the train tracks, but and sometimes the train would come one direction, another time the train would go the other direction, and it came to a tunnel at that point and went through, and, and uh, though no one had ever been hired for the task, uh, an old man lived near the railroad track, and he would go out there and have a little three-legged stool and sit out there with his lantern, and he just felt like, you know, one day they couldn't make a mistake and there'd be two trains coming at the same time. And, and he said, I just feel like there ought to be somebody out there warning him just in case. I... He did this for years. There never was an incident where the trains came from the one direction, the other direction. Well, the old man died. And just a few days later, there was nobody at that point with the lantern. And the two trains collided up there just near Thurmont. And many people died in that train wreck. And, and uh, listen, somebody's got to stand at the tracks and say, no, don't go any further. Don't go any further. Friend, you don't go any further. There's a real hell. Don't go any further. There's a real place called hell. I don't want you to go there. We as soul winners are there. They're blocking the road, shouting, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. He said, what if they don't get saved? But we still got one. So we could be standing the highway at the bridge out, and they may they may almost knock you down and go around you and go over the cliff. But we still, if any responsibility in us at all, any care at all, we're going to stand there and try to warn them if they go us. We see the first motivation so when it's love, compassion makes a difference. Notice the second. Look with me in verse 23. And others saved with fear. Fear is a legitimate motivation in soul winning. Fear. Now, there needs to be a fear of where these young people are going to end up in their life if they don't trust Christ. There needs to be a fear for where our siblings are going to end up in life if they don't reject if they reject Christ. Where are they going to be in a few years? Some say with fear. Fear. There's a certain fear. It terrifies us to think that they go out of this world and, and, and breathe their last breath of life and the next breath they breathe be in hell. Uh, Brother Lou preached a message here right after 9-11. Some of you probably heard Brother Lou and Philip Antonio preach this message. He talked about when those planes hit those twin towers. And uh, we as Americans... Uh, and, and if you have any patriotism in you whatsoever, we were moved by all that. I'm afraid a lot of us have forgotten about 9-11, but we should never forget about 9-11. Right. It should always be before us. But, uh, but he pointed out something in that message. We, we kind of get the impression, you know, we are, we are a God-fearing country. And so it's, we didn't say it, but it was kind of implied. You know, those, those planes hit those 
those towers, and people perished in those fires. And uh, we, we almost implied it. Well, that was evil striking those towers and those people dying. But we are saintly people inside the towers. Some of you saw it and watched it live on television. I did. I, I remember exactly where it was on 9-11. I was up on, on, on a ladder painting the church. And, and the uh, Pepsi truck stopped right in front of the ladder where the ladder was. Stopped there. And he had his radio and he just pulled over. And they began announcing on the radio. And he began to say, you hear this? You, did you hear that? And myself and another man came down the ladders and we stood there by his truck. And then we went and found television and watched those planes hit those towers. And saw people jumping out of those buildings. The fire in those buildings, the heat was so bad that they came. And they, knowing that, you know, you're all those stories up in the air, knowing there's no way you would survive the fall. But yet, to get out of that, the torture, the heat, the suffering of those flames, they jumped out the windows of those buildings. And Brother Lou pointed out most of them jumped out of that fire into an eternal hell. The fire in that building was nothing like the fire that they experienced just a few seconds later. And we tend to want to think, well, they all went to heaven. They, that's not the case. The people in those buildings, like most people, most places, the majority do not know Christ. And most of them jumped out of the flames of, of that building into a fiery, burning hell. Somebody ought to be afraid that others are going to go there. There ought to be a fear. I don't want you to go there. Please don't go there. There needs to be a fear inside of us that somebody could end up there. Some have compassion making the difference. Others save with fear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me turn there just quickly. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 in verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. That particular verse, by the way, has to do with us standing before the, the fire judgment of the judgment seat of Christ where our works are burned up. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, we do a lot of things for God, but most of it is just going to burn up. At the judgment seat of Christ. But reward, there'll be rewards for so many. That's spiritual rewards for so many. Many of the things that we do, and we call it social work, and we call it humanitarian, there's no rewards for that at the judgment seat of Christ. The rewards are for the spiritual, the gold, silver, precious stone, not wood, hay, and stubble that will burn up in the fires of the judgment of Christ. Knowing, therefore, the, the terror of the Lord. Fear is a legitimate motivation yes. for soul winning. Notice the next one. Verse 23. Again. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. You know, there's a certain segment of our society that are adventuresome. Fearless. You know, we, uh, we think of those, that, those who, uh, uh, the firemen who rush into a burning building. You think of military soldiers running toward the bullets. Now, obviously, they can measures to safely go and do their mission, but, uh, but yet, uh, running toward danger. Most of us in society, we run from danger. If it's dangerous, danger's over there, I'm going over here, thank you very much. But there's a certain segment of society, danger motivates them. I, you know, you think about uh, some of these things that some people do, uh, climbing up on the side of the mountain, you know, hanging by, by the toenails up there. I'm thinking, you know, eating a bologna sandwich and drinking a Coca-Cola at the bottom of the mountain sounds pretty good to me. But yeah. th they're up there just, you know, like a spider climbing up on What motivates somebody? There's just some people, they just motivated by going the great adventure. Great adventure. And uh, there, the certain people become police officers. There's a certain thing that motivates them. Think, I'm making a difference. I'm making a difference. And, and there, there are certain people that, he said, well, but aren't, you, aren't you concerned about how dangerous it is? And it is dangerous to be a police officer in America today. Yes. But thank God there are people willing to do it. 
And uh, understand, there are certain uh, jobs that we think of that are dangerous, but thank God people do it and are willing to do it. You ever, you ever read uh, or see those videos of people building those tall buildings in New York City, walking out there in those steel beams? And I'm thinking, there ain't no way. Like, you say you're afraid of heights? No, I'm afraid of falling. I'm not afraid of the heights. It's, that it's not being like that height. It's been down there. It scares me. But uh, there are some people that are adventurous. It motivates them. I'll tell you, the venture of all adventures, get you a handful of gospel tracts and go out and tell sinners about Christ. It's an adventure. Unlike any other adventure. You've got an ounce of adventure, some spirit in you. Uh, go out there and win people to Christ. Go win people to Jesus. Notice here in this passage, he says, and some, pulling them out of the fire. What's he compared? He's compared to a firefighter. Going into that burning house. The, 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 the roof is caving in. Flames have engulfed the house, but yet they risk their body and limb to get in that house and to carry that person out to safety. That's the spirit that can motivate people in some way. Going anywhere, going any, anywhere, and doing the job. A friend of mine, I don't, I don't want to scare you. I just said, usually these things don't happen. A friend of mine went out in the country one time, went up, he started, got out of his car and started up the hill, and, and, and bullets started firing all around him. And, uh, and the guy said, who are you? And he told him who, I was, who he was. And it wasn't me. He said, tell him who he was. He said, he said, I'm a preacher from the church. I'm here. Tell you about the Lord. He said, I knew you were either crazy or a preacher. And he said, come on up. <laughs> and, uh, listen, uh, it's an adventure. We've had a lot of adventures. Brother Bob changed stories sometimes that we've had out soul winning about the man who one night we were soul winning in, uh, uh, over here in... Uh, Hillcrest area, and we had gotten done, and we're getting ready to leave, and it was dark. And uh, so we, we got out of the car, but I left my New Testament in the car, my Bible in the car. And so, and we're talking to this guy, and, and it's, it's pitch black, you can hardly see your hand in front of you. And uh, the man is interested in trusting Christ. And so I, I reached my New Testament, and I didn't have it, and Bob had already put his Bible in the car. And so I reached back, and I found my wallet. And I pulled my wallet out, much like this. I pulled it out and I said, well, you understand the Bible says over here in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it was so dark he couldn't see what I was pointing at. And the man prayed and trusted Christ. We laughed about the man got saved in my wallet that night. And uh, I guess we could take in God we trust over there and lead him to Christ, you know. But, uh, but you know what? And we've had so much fun. We've had adventures just up the top of the hill at, at the uh, apartments at the top of the hill one day. Bob and I were exchanging doors, knocking on doors, and we came to a door, uh, and he knocked, and nobody came to the door, so I stepped up to the next door and knocked, and just as I did, somebody came that, down that door, and then, so we were standing at two separate doors talking to people side by side, and at the door, well, I didn't get to talk to the person, because at the door I was at, there was a weird sound inside. He was talking, and I hear this sounds like a, an animal in pain, whining. And I'm looking through the screen door trying to figure out what is going on. And I, I did what I would not normally do. I, I, I opened the door so I could peek in. And when I did, at the top of the steps, there was a woman standing there. She was covered in blood from the front of her face all the way down the front of her. And there was a little boy, looked like maybe about three years old, standing by her side, had her by the hand, and he was crying. Tears were running off down his face, and he was standing there, and she was just covered in blood. And, and I... I opened that door, I ran up the steps, said, man, I'm going to go down here and get your house number, and I'm going to call 911. Just stay right here, it's going to be all right. And she, could, she couldn't talk, she was so upset. And I just ran down the steps, looked up, got the number, called 911. Pretty soon the ambulance was there, uh, the police arrived, and found out that she had a living boyfriend, and just minutes before we got there, had beat the daylights out of her. What's wrong with these women with these living boyfriend things? They won't marry you. Say adios. Have a nice day. Why would you let some scumbag live off of you, ladies? But they do it. And that's what had happened here. And, uh, and so Bob and I are standing there and, and we're waiting. And, and there's the police officers. There, there's the EMTs. They're all helping this woman to bring her down the steps on the cot out to the ambulance. And all the neighbors are out looking on, trying to see what was happening. Bob and I had this conversation. Well, maybe we ought to go someplace else. 
probably not going to have an opportunity to talk to anybody here. This is the truth. I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. You know, why does a preacher have to say, I'm telling the truth now? This is the truth. Like what I said wasn't the truth before. But we went, stepped over to the next house. We literally had police officers walking between us, talking to the neighbors, right where we we're trying to witness to them. I mean, they're passing between us. There's so many people passing by us. But this is the truth. The next six houses we went to, somebody got saved. Six, I've never had six houses in a row people got saved before. But that day, I guess you've got to have somebody get beat up to get the crowd done. I don't know how you do it. But, uh, but six houses in a row, somebody got saved. And we came back shouting, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God still saves souls. Listen, there are adventures in this matter of soul winning. <laughs> One of the funniest stories I've ever heard about soul winning came from Curtis Hudson. He had a man in his church that... Uh, he, this man came to him one day with his pastor down in Georgia and said, Preacher, if you ever want to go soul winning, don't have anybody to go with you. Just call me. I'll go soul winning with you. Well, one night, Brother Hudson's wife was out of town in a ladies' conference, and it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. He couldn't sleep, and he decided, I'm going soul winning. And so he, he got some tracks, went over to his, that man's house. The man was in bed. He came, came to the door. He said, Preacher, is something wrong? He said, no, I'm just going to sow with you. He said, you go so with you. If everyone goes so with you, anybody go with me. He said, preacher, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. You go and knock on somebody's door at 1 o'clock in the morning, they'll shoot you. He said, I don't know about that. But God woke me up once we go so with you. You said you'd go with me. He said, oh, preacher, I'm in it. I'm in it. I'll go with you. And so what they did, they went down and got a gas can and filled it with gas and started driving around the beltway around Atlanta, Georgia, looking for anybody that was sitting on the side of the road that ran out of gas. And pretty soon they saw a car sitting up there, sure enough. And there was a man standing beside his car, his wife and kids were in the car, and he was standing, leaning up against the car, kind of all frustrated, look on his face there. And Brother Hudson pulled in behind him, got out, and the uh, and the, the man was a little nervous. There's strange cars, strange people pulling in behind him there. And, uh, and uh, he said, can I help you? He said, yeah, we've been looking for you. Curtis Hudson said, we've been driving around looking for you, and uh, we got some gas for you to help you get gone. He said, looking for me? How'd you know I was out here? You know, this was days before cell phones and all that kind of business. How'd you know I was out here? I, I, don't, I can't explain that to you, but we were looking for you. And then the man got real nervous. He's watching me. He's putting that gas in there. He said, Curtis Hudson said, I knew he, he thought I was going to charge him $100 a gallon for it or something, or that we were there to rob him. So, so he said, he was watching me all the time, putting that gas in the car, and he when it got done, he said, he turned around and said, the reason we're out here is that I believe God wants me to tell you about Jesus, how you can be saved. That's why we've been looking for you. We thought somebody would be out here. And he shared the gospel. That man and his wife both trusted Christ as their Savior there alongside the road. And uh, he tells the story. As they, they, they go down him and his buddy, his buddy said, I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen anything like that in my life. He said, that's wonderful. And, uh, he, and he got shouting. His buddy got in, and not normally shouted me, Woo! Glory to God! Hallelujah! They had a little big, a little bitty Renault, Renault car, and it was a little tiny thing. And uh, but they got shouting in that car. He said the window got all steamed up. But he said, I got to calm down. I got to go up here to the gas station and get some more gas. Calm down. He said every time you get ready to point at the gas station, his buddy would go, Woo! Glory to God! He said I'd go right on through and come back, do another circle, come back again. He said about five or six times before I got him calm down enough, I could get out, put gas in the car. He said, they, six people that night they found out of gas on the highway and people got saved that night. Listen, it just takes somebody with some adventure, some spirit to tell people about Jesus. Aren't you bored with just boring Christianity where you come to church and sit there and you, you hear a sermon and you sit there and you come back for another one next week? That's boring. That's not Christianity. That's why it's boring. Christianity is exciting. Seeing God work in people's lives. God save souls. I think we were up north of town. Uh, it's been a couple years ago now. And I got out of the car and there's a teenage boy there with his recycle being pointed out to the sidewalk. And we were all signed for the Kirkinsons one way or another. And uh, this boy was right there and I got out and I, I started talking to the boy. And, and uh, and there this teenage boy, about 14 years old, bowed his head, trusted Christ right there by the recycling bin at the street. And, uh, and he said, 
You know, and I didn't, you know, you don't know what God's doing. This boy said, you know, my dad's a Christian. He's been praying for me for a long time. And he said, Praise the Lord. And, I, and his dad came out of the house and wondered why he was so long at the, at the recycle bin at the street. And I said, your dad's going to be excited. First thing you do, you, go, you tell your dad you just got saved. And he went running back up the house to tell his dad he got saved. This is exciting stuff, folks. Yep. This is fun. Some, have, some win souls because of the adventure. Pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. Like a fireman rushing into a burning building. Pull them out of the fire. You got any adventure in you? Yeah, get quiet to some soul winning. Boldly go where no man's gone before. You know? Go, go places. Don't be afraid to go where, where they said no, where nobody goes down that neighborhood. That's an exciting place to go. I mean, find the thrill of it. Telling people about Jesus. But notice another. Some have compassion making a difference. Love and compassion is a a good motivation for soul winning. Others say with fear. Fear is a good motivation for soul winning. Uh, pulling them out of the fire. Some adventures. Spirit is, is a good motivation for soul winning. But notice this one. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now this one may surprise you. Hate is a good motivation for soul winning. Hate? I didn't think we're supposed to hate anything. I wouldn't give you a dime for a gardener that didn't hate weeds. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to a doctor at all that didn't hate illness and sickness. You want to go to a doctor that hates sickness. You want, to, you want a doctor that hates illness. You want somebody with some, with some, that gets stirred up over things. You know, Dr. Bob Grave was preaching years ago, and, and as he preached, nobody said amen. Nobody said anything through his sermon. He just stopped and said, folks, say something. Uh, feel something while I'm preaching. Don't just sit there and look at me. Get mad. That's better than not doing anything. We need, to, we need to get some anger in our life again. What makes you angry? I know we get angry over the stupidest thing. You know, my green beans were a little cold when I ate the restaurant the other day. Oh, I'll tell you why. Yeah. We get angry over the stupidest things. We don't get angry about that there's a devil taking people off into hell. You're right. Why are we going to get flat and mad at him? Do you understand what he's doing to your family? <laughs> or trying to do to your family? Do you understand what he's doing to your friends? Or trying to do to your friends? Do you understand what he's trying to do with your country? Why don't you run and say, Booker Man, you out declare war? Why not? He said, we might make him mad. Oh, he's already mad. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He's going to knock on your door whether you knock on his or not. So why don't you knock on the door? Say, you know where I'm at. And I'm going to be out telling people about Jesus in case you come looking for me. We need to act like the devil is more powerful than our God. And so, you understand, I, I came across this quote, and I think Charles Spurgeon got it right. He said, what every Christian needs is to, number one, Love God. Number two, love others. Number three, get angry. You, you ladies, you ever get mad? Boy, you really clean the house when you get mad. I mean, you'll clean, you'll clean every nook and cranny when you're mad. Feet, anger motivates us. Now, first of all, the Bible says, be ye angry and sin. Now, it didn't say that, that anger is sin. It doesn't, anger is not all anger is sin. But when you're angry, don't sin. You're going to get angry if you got. We're going to get angry about some things. But while you're angry, don't do something stupid or dumb. But understand, it you know, it motivates us in anger. We need to get mad at the devil. We need to get angry. I'll give you an example of my own life. I was church camp. It's about I don't know when wee hours in the morning. When I get a knock on the window where I was staying, I was, uh, we had a family camp our church had, and I was there uh, at the caretakers. I, I was helping with the youth part of the camp and uh, as a young preacher. And I knocked on the window, and I looked, and there was the, hank, the, the, the hankies, or the hankies, I can't remember now which one it is, one or the other, were looking at me through the window. They were the caretakers, him and his wife. And they said, Brother Fry, you've got a phone call down at the kitchen. And it's only phone that's on the whole campus of the camp was down in the kitchen. Uh, and so I, 
I got dressed and I went down there to the kitchen, got on the phone, the phone was laying there on the table, uh, and I picked it up and I said, hello, I had no idea who I was talking to and it was my uncle. He said, Tom, they just rushed your dad to the hospital and it didn't look good. And, uh, and he said, I think you want to try to get there as quickly as possible. Well, it was several miles there, back to, uh, to the hospital in Linton, Indiana, Green County General Hospital. But I remember driving there. My dad was not saved. As far as my, I knew, my dad has never trusted Christ. I'd witnessed him so many times. He used to get angry when I'd witnessed to him, threatened, bodily threatened me for telling him about Christ. And he would get, he'd get all so angry about it. But that, and I was thinking, oh God, I just want one more chance to talk. And so I had no idea what was wrong completely. But when I got to the hospital in a small town uh, area where I was from, I had been a preacher in that area. Everybody knew me. And I remember I walked in those double doors at the hospital. I didn't have to say, uh, uh, where's Robert Fry or where's Bob Fry? When I walked in the doors, the lady at the desk just pointed down to me and said, he's down there. She knew who I was and said, he's down there. And I went down the hall, went into that little room. And there, uh, one of the ladies from our church was the respiratory therapist and she worked the bus route in our church and she was there by my dad's side holding a mask on his oxygen mask on his face and she didn't have to say a word the look on her face told me everything i needed to know this was serious and apparently dad had worked done some farm work that day helped throw bells of hay and he came in and he was having trouble with, some, with his breathing and he started coughing up blood and so they called an ambulance he was taken to the hospital and, and so here in the hospital, the oxygen mask, every once in a while, he, he was gasping for every breath. Every once in a while, he'd cough, and a little blood was splattered up in that mask. And she pulled it off, wiped it off, and put it back on his face. And I remember standing at this Buddhist bed, not knowing, what do I interrupt? Do I, what can I do? And she's so, you know, this young lady is very busy trying to keep him alive. Do I interrupt her? What do I say? My dad only said a couple words to me that whole time. I must have been in 10 or 15 minutes. He reached up and pulled a mask off and said, don't think I'm going to make it. Put the mask back in place. And I'm standing there. And then, as sudden as you can imagine, he inhaled. And just like he didn't exhale. It was over. It was over. And I'm standing there. No more opportunities to witness. No more times to try to tell him about Christ. The opportunities were gone. Just that quickly. And by the way, they're going to be quickly in your friend's lives and your loved one's life. If we're not careful, they'll come quickly. And I, I was scheduled to preach to the teenagers 9 o'clock the next morning at camp. May I tell you, there's no place in the world that I wanted to be except by myself during that time. I did not want to go get a shower and drive back to the camp. I, I just didn't think I could do it even. And I remember saying, God, what do I do? And I remember I did get a shower and I did go back to camp. I preached that morning in the camp and that on a simple, simple message that the time is far spent and we are not all saved. The altars were filled that morning. Every teenager in that camp was at the altar. Every last one of them prayed for God to help them reach somebody in their life they knew that was lost. And I said, God, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be here. But God took it and used it that morning in the lives of a whole lot of teenagers. I'm saying today, when are we going to get motivated? You say, well, well I just, that doesn't bother me. Well, find out what does motivate you. Maybe it is fear. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's the adventure. Maybe it's just plain hatred for the devil. And I remember that morning, what really motivated me when I drive it back to that camp. I was, I was, somebody said, you shouldn't talk to the devil. Why well, I had a little talk with him on the way there. And I said, devil, as far as I know, you just drug my dad into hell. I'm going to make sure the rest of my life you regret it. I'm going to take the rest of my life I'm going to spend telling people how to get saved. You're going to regret you drug my dad off into hell. When are we going to declare war on him? 
Why are we so passive allowing him just destroy us? With, and we just go on. Okay. When are we going to get motivated to hate the devil? Somebody said, you hate him, I hate him. Somebody asked Billy Sunday, you mean you believe there's a real devil? Billy Sunday said, I know there's a real devil. I used to do business with him. Heard about him. Billy Sunday sometimes in his preaching, he was right in the middle of the sermon. Devil, get out of here! He'd throw a chair across the platform. Devil, get out of here! I'm preaching like that. You see, we, we think the devil is some fellow with a pronged tail and a pitchfork running around in his red long johns. That's not who he is. He's after your family members. He's after your testimony. He's after your loved ones. When are we going to get angry? When are we going to get angry about it? Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now i got more I can say there. Verse 24 and 25. I'm going to stop there. I ask you today. What would it take to motivate you? to be a soul winner. What would it take? Yeah. I'll close with this. Dan Tony used to tell this illustration often about a preacher who felt like his ministry had become just kind of routine. And one day he prayed and said, Oh God, it's like I don't even believe in hell anymore. He said, God, give me a vision of hell. And the country preacher prayed and was very earnest about it. It was a few days later in that little rural area that the fire trucks went by from his home down to a little public school. It was just a little, all the grades, a little small school in a little rural community. It wasn't a very big school, just a few hundred students in a whole school from first grade on to 12. And he sees the the fire trucks going up to the schoolhouse. The preacher had a son, a little boy in the third grade in that school. He gets in his car and drives up as close as he can get, gets out of his car and walks on up, and he's trying to find out about what's, what's going on, and uh, he finally gets a report that everybody's out of the school. They've got everybody out of school except for one class. One class of students they have not been able to get out of the school. And then he says, who is it? What class is it? It's a third grade class. And they gave him the name of the teacher that's in there with several students. That was the class his little boy was in. He stayed in there, looking on, helpless to do anything. The firefighters working frantically. And, he, and all of a sudden, that heat in there blew those front windows out of that building, revealing a classroom full of students backed up against the wall. But the teacher, looking out, fire between them and safety. And that man looked in there and he said he saw the face of his little boy up against the wall. And his little boy, he said he saw his face. He said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. But there's nothing he could do. And in just a few moments, the ceiling came down. And they all perished. The man went away and said, God, I prayed for a vision of hell, but I didn't know it was going to be like that. Listen, you get a vision of hell, it's going to be that and worse. What hell's like. It'll be far worse than that if we really could understand what hell is like. I don't know, somebody said it's only a few miles down from the crust of the earth. Down, uh, someone speculated maybe it's like nine miles. I've often thought, I wonder if dad's only about nine miles away but as good as a million. I'm challenged today. Let's not just talk about being a soul winning church. What is a soul winning church? It's a church where people soul win. Not something we have on our doctrinal statement of soul winning. It's a church where people soul win. I want to challenge you today. I'm not, I'm not saying you're able to be here on Sunday afternoons. That would be wonderful. But Brother Kirk will help you and, and, and you'll learn a great deal. But listen, find some time in your week that you can just get some tracks and go out and not, Whether it be just a few houses around your neighborhood or some of your friends or family members. If you just want one person a week or two or three people a week, but get started on this journey. Because there is a real heaven and a real hell. This is Bible Christianity. Now, they, you could go down the street to 
First Methodist Church, and they won't tell you anything when I just over here. You can go to different, they used to, by the way. I remember when the Methodists had so many programs. And you can go over here to the Presbyterian Church. I remember when the Presbyterian churches had so many programs. D. James Candy had used to organize so many programs in Presbyterian churches. But you can go around and find a lot of Baptist churches and we're not doing it anymore either. We're just playing the game. I want to challenge you. Don't play the game anymore. Find out what motivates you. And use it to stir you up to care about souls. Why don't we pray about that? The message today, stir our hearts. Help us, Lord. I get so apathetic. I get so lazy. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing the things of the world to so distract and burn up all our time and all our energies when there is a real heaven and a real hell. Oh God, give us Bible Christianity, so many Christianity, Lord, the real stuff. Lord. Help us now, Lord. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. I'm having to stand to your feet in the very place of mercy.